What I'm going to talk about today is a general introduction to some important things connected with genetics, uh, science of speech sound, and uh, phonology, uh, where we show how sounds function in language. Now, anybody who learns a language is going to be, whether they like it or not, willy-nilly, as the phrase is in English, willy-nilly, they're going to be a phonetician. And you can either be a good one or a bad one, because you're going to study the sounds of the language, obviously. And you've come to join this summer course, so I think you've all made the right decision. So congratulations on that discovery. Now, we have to choose one accent of English to describe uh, as uh, what we term a model. And we shall choose a variety which is a so-called uh, prestige accent. It doesn't work. It's a, good a so-called prestige accent, uh, or acrolect. Acro means high in Greek, like the Acropolis, high above Athens. And the accent we're going to choose is a social accent and not a regional accent. Uh, it has an influence out of proportion to the percentage of speakers. It's prominent in public life and on media, that's to say on radio and television. And a lot of you will realize the accent I'm talking about is the one which was, uh, or which has been known for many years as received pronunciation, or RP. Why received? Because it's the old word, the old Victorian word, for socially acceptable. All this sounds dreadfully snobbish, and I think it did start out that way as something which was regarded as a suitably snobbish accent for uh, non-natives to learn. But it, it is essentially a social accent rather than a geographical accent. It isn't spoken anywhere particularly in Britain. You can't say in Britain, where is the best English spoken? Nobody, uh, no English person, no British person ever, ever uh, uh, says that. Um, as I say, it's traditionally known as received pronunciation, almost always shortened to RP. Uh, in the popular language, it's often called things like Oxford English or the Queen's uh, English. Both of these terms are a bit inappropriate because if you go to Oxford, you'll find there, oh, there is a, a local uh, accent, and I presume it meant originally the accent of the, uh, the university teachers, but even they'll have a variety of accents these days. And the Queen's English, well, I think uh, whilst the Queen does speak old, uh, RP, a rather old fashioned variety of it, I don't think that even she believes it's their exclusive property. Um, and with a bit more justification, this speech has been called BBC English. And in fact, uh, that term is still used, BBC uh, English. Um, Peter Roach and Jane Setter, uh, in their uh, dictionary, the uh, EPD, Daniel Jones's uh, EPD, they refer to this as BBC English. I don't um, agree with this because nowadays, you'll find that on the BBC, you hear all kinds of English, or local accents, albeit in modified uh, form. So I don't think it's a very good term. Um, I normally uh, call it uh, NRP, uh, meaning non-regional pronunciation. And I hoped that everybody uh, was going to take up this uh, term that uh, I invented, but unfortunately, Overwhelmingly, they haven't. And uh, nowadays, uh, linguists often refer to this sort of English as standard Southern British English, or uh, uh, SSBE. Uh, I think, once again, this is not a very appropriate term. You can argue with virtually every one of its uh, components. Um, probably, like most tutors on this course, I shall referred to this kind of English as uh, being, uh, uh, just call it RP. What I will say is that when people here refer to RP, or indeed to standard Southern British English, or to NRP, or whatever, 
what they're thinking of is a much wider definition than the original one proposed. Nowadays, I think we think of this model of English as encompassing uh, a lot of uh, accents that uh, are uh, mostly RP, but which may contain some uh, regional uh, elements uh, to them. And the other thing is that, as we'll uh, discover, uh, the RP itself is changing. The speech of young people uh, no longer sounds like the speech of the Queen or the uh, Duke of Edinburgh. Even the young people in the royal family, their speech doesn't sound like the Queen or the, uh, the Duke of Edinburgh. Notice also that we don't consider uh, accents like RP to be especially melodious or, um, or beautiful in some way, though the general public uh, quite often does. But we do acknowledge that they have a certain amount of uh, social uh, prestige. So in the 21st century, um, frankly, the whole concept has a somewhat dated feel. Traditional RP has lost a lot of its former unassailable, uh, uh, unassailable characteristics. Um, although I didn't start out that way, I now regard myself as being um, uh, an RP speaker. Um, but uh, I sometimes feel um, a little bit uh, outmoded when I'm with a, a lot of younger, uh, younger people. Uh, and as I said, nowadays we try to encompass this wider uh, version of the accent which is in uh, current use. Um, Nowadays, you find the term uh, RP, or more often received pronunciation, uh, used in newspapers as well. At one time, people, only linguists knew about it, but nowadays you'll find that journalists will talk about it, often very inaccurately. But nevertheless, they know what the, uh, the concept uh, is. Now, of course, uh, English isn't the only uh, language which has a prestige accent of this, course, of this sort. Uh, quite often you read books which give you that idea that English is the only uh, language in the world which has um, prestige accents. It's just not true. If you go to France, you will rapidly realize that educated Parisian French has this uh, status. Uh, if you go to Holland, there's a variety of Dutch uh, which has this social prestige. And overwhelmingly, it's the variety that non-natives, that foreigners, uh, learn. Uh, if you learn French, you usually learn educated Parisian French. If you uh, were to learn Dutch, then you'd learn the prestige variety of Dutch, probably, rather than anything else. But, of course, these other languages don't have a rival uh, across the ocean, which uh, RP does. And so we have, with uh, RP, we also have uh, another accent uh, and that is um, the American pronunciation model. Now, in uh, America, you have a variety of English which goes under, I think, two general names. One is General American. Some Americans don't like this term. Um, and even though they recognize the existence of the, uh, of the accent. Uh, but there's also a term, because it's used very commonly on TV and radio, it's, uh, so in the media, it's often termed network. It's used on radio and TV networks, and it's often termed network uh, America. Network American is taught very widely uh, to uh, people who are learning English as a foreign language. So it's uh, very much the alternative uh, to learning um, uh, received pronunciations, really to learning RP. Uh, it depends on where you live or what is the custom in your own country which you're going to uh, choose. Um, in reality, you will find that educated American English and educated British English, as spoken by native speakers, uh, these are very much intelligible uh, between the two. There are very few instances where you have misunderstandings. People joke over misunderstandings uh, uh, sometimes, but uh, they're the exception rather than the rule. 
there are some uh, there are some cases where you have uh, clear differences which which could cause uh, something of this sort. So, for instance, uh, we use the term for um, a person who deals with a junior administrator. We call him a clerk. C L E R K. And uh, there's the story of the man who was in um, uh, in America and in a pub or a bar, and he was asked by an American by a stranger, "What is your job?" And so the man said, "I'm a clerk." The man looked at him in great surprise. He said, "You mean to say you go tick tock, tick tock?" <laughs> 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 <But> <laughs> These, these of course, whilst they may be amusing, they're rarities. We don't, you don't, you have to search out isolated uh, words where you find this, uh, where you find these kinds of uh, uh, problems. Uh, the interesting thing, uh, as I say, about uh, uh, educated British English, educated American English, and indeed educated Australian English, uh, is how uh, clearly intelligible they are. Um, and as I often say, it's unquestionably, English in the present day is unquestionably the most widespread form of international communication that has ever uh, existed. So if you learn to speak one of these varieties uh, well, then you'll be understood, I think, uh, all over the globe. We move on to uh, another matter, and that is the analysis of uh, of, that, of uh, speech and how we can uh, get to uh, consider uh, sounds and how they're formed and how they relate to each other. Now, one of the most important things that you will be doing on this course is familiarizing yourself with what is sometimes called loosely phonetic transcription. Indeed, we've already had this uh, introduced to you in Michael's lectures yesterday and uh, by your tutors. Uh, you'll find out that phonetic is a rather inaccurate term for uh, this. Transcription is very useful because it enables you to write down easily differences in pronunciation and to read the representation of the dictionary uh, uh, pronunciation that you find in most uh, English dictionaries. The commonest form of transcription is actually called phonemic transcription and not phonetic transcription. Why is it called phonemic transcription? Because it represents uh, phonemes. So this means that we'll have to very shortly to discover uh, what is meant by a phoneme. Another useful aspect of transcription is it deals easily with the spelling <coughs> and sound relationships of English. Now, there is uh, a set of phrase that if God invented the English language, then the devil provided the spelling system. <laughs> because, uh, as you probably know, uh, English spelling is full of complications, uh, full of contradictions, etc., etc. Actually, it's a bit like the English weather. It's not as bad as people make out. I know it's difficult to persuade you about this if you've got yourself soaking wet on the way here uh, today, uh, but nevertheless, it's true. In actual fact, you'll find that if you learn a few guidelines, English spelling uh, falls uh, into a bit more, for, falls into uh, place. But nevertheless, it's clearly necessary for a language like English, as is also true for other languages, like French, for instance, um, or Danish, which have very, um, uh, very uh, uh, old-fashioned, inaccurate spelling systems. Uh, it's necessary for these languages to have some form of transcription so that you can discover quite easily which sound is represented, in particular, which vowels are uh, being uh, uh, represented. Um, now, let's see what happens when we look at uh, a sentence in English like, an elephant never forgets. So the phonemes that I've got there on the top row, this is the representation 
uh, of that. Um, what do we mean uh, here then uh, by uh, a funk? Well, we're going to find that out very shortly. But let's say that when you have the phonemes, you can also see that these can be combined into syllables. Um, it's very difficult to define uh, a syllable, uh, though it's um, a bit uh, like an elephant. It's quite easy to recognize one when you see one. Uh, and you'll see here that what you can define it as, in a sense, is something, an element of a word which is greater in extent than uh, a phoneme um, and, uh, uh, and uh, not in, not in uh, a greater in extent than uh, a word. Um, so words are composed of uh, syllables. Um, the syllable is shown here in diagrammatic form. It's also on your hand up, so you don't have to draw it. And you can see that a syllable is composed of uh, these elements, an onset. The onset will be the consonants that are at the beginning of the, uh, of the syllable. The second element of the syllable is what's known as the rhyme. Why is it called the rhyme? Because in traditional poetry, this is the bit that forms the rhyme. The rhyme can be divided between the nucleus, which is normally a vowel, and what is known as the coda. And the coda are the consonants at the end of the uh, syllable. We can des describe syllables in different ways. We can have open syllables, which consist only of uh, a final vowel, no consonants at the end. Closed syllables, where you have a consonant at the end, you have a coda. So here you have bite, buys, for instance, T and the Z, uh, closing the syllable there. And we can describe the combinations of consonants around the vowel. The vowel, remember, we turn the nucleus. Uh, we can, dis we can uh, call those consonant clusters. And so you'll find uh, we often refer, in talking about syllables, to consonant clusters, to open syllables and close syllables. In English, you have a fairly complicated cons uh, syllable structure. So you have, uh, for example, the possibility here in a word like straw of three constants in onset position. In coda position, you can have as many as four constants. Not very many words with four consonants, you have to do things like uh, picking uh, numerals, numerals uh, generally to find. So twelfths uh, gives us four consonants in final position. You'll actually find a lot of English people, when they say twelfths, cheat. And they leave out the S, the F, sorry, and they say uh, twelfths. Uh, and it's, uh, it passes unnoticed. But potentially, at least, you have four consonants in the coda uh, position there. So, once again, then, we have the possibility of three in onset, three consonants onset position, uh, and uh, a vowel in uh, nucleus position, and then uh, in, uh, uh, as the coda, we have the possibility of up to four consonants. Um, this is much more complex than some other languages. So, for instance, uh, in some languages, uh, one finds that you can only have uh, 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 syllables consisting of a consonant plus a vowel. Uh, Japanese is, I believe, an example of this. This means when Japanese people come to learn English, one of their big problems is learning to deal with the, con with the many consonants that cluster together uh, in uh, English. Let's go back now to consider the question of the phoneme. Now, a phoneme uh, can be defined 
loosely as a sound that can change the meaning uh, of a word. If we take any language, of course we have to take English, but we could do it for any language if we uh, wanted to. We could do it for Zulu, we could do it for Hindi, whatever. We'll come across word pairs which are distinguished by a single segment. Segment, if you remember, is our term which covers consonants and vowels. So, you have a single contrastive sound. So I can take, and I think these are on your handout, you could take um, a set of words such as pill, bill, hill, till, sill, fill, will, and there, there are even more, where the onset consonant varies. We could also take the word medial, the nucleus vowel, medial being in the middle, so the word in the nucleus there in the middle, hill, hole, hell, hall, heel, and you could find many more if you so wish. We could also take the coda, and we could have hill, hit, him, hip, his, him. We call a pair of words that varies in this way, like hill and bill, we call them a minimal pair. If we add more, and we put in, say, will, and till, and sill, then we get what we call minimal sets. Now, by building up these uh, minimal sets, then we'll find out that there are certain sounds which can change the meanings of words. Because hill doesn't mean the same as pill. Pill doesn't mean the same as pill. You could also use examples for this from your native languages. So I say it applies to any language you care to name. I can't do it uh, for you, and I can't do it in this lecture because you've all got different languages. But you can do it for yourselves, and in fact, I think it would be a good exercise for you uh, to do so. The units of sound that we derive as a result of this process, we term phonemes. And the adjective <coughs> is phonemic. And they can be considered, as it were, as the sound building blocks of the language. And the definition of the phoneme, and it's on your handout, is that it's a member of a set of abstract units which together form the sound system of a given language and through which contrasts and meaning are produced. And that's a, a reasonably accurate definition, I think, match definition. But as I say, a rough and ready way of thinking about a phoneme is simply this. It's a sound which can change the meaning of a word. That's the thing to hold in your mind. Phoneme is a sound which can change the meaning uh, of a word. If you take this process of finding minimal sets and putting all the information together, your result is what is termed a phonemic inventory. So the uh, complete set of phonemes for the language. And you have a phonemic inventory of English. Uh, so RP English, if we did it for American English, it would be slightly different. Uh, but uh, for RP English, uh, you'll find that on page 103, where I think you'll, you can't put all that, you'll find there are 20 vowels and 24 consonants. Uh, and those, I think, were introduced to you uh, last uh, in your um, bio tutors. Briefly referred to by uh, Michael. Now, does this mean that every sound that you make can be, or every, every sound is potentially capable of changing meaning? No, it doesn't. Because you will find that a phoneme consists of varieties of sounds. And so if we take English L, for instance, we can hear a number of different varieties of L. 
and you have a distinction which is normally referred to, some of you may have heard of it before, clear L and dark L. In fact, there is another quite distinct uh, allophone, which I'll mention, which is uh, so-called voiceless L. And you can hear the difference between these sounds uh, quite easily. So clear L sounds like this, a la, la, la. Dark L sounds like this, o, o. And voiceless L sounds like this. <laughs> and curiously, these three L's, if you present them in words to uh, a native English speaker, not somebody who's a dedicated phonetician, but I mean, you know, just go out to the street and, uh, and pick somebody at random. Uh, after them thinking that you're a little peculiar in asking this question and thinking about whether you were, they were going to call the police, uh, then you would find, if you presented these uh, uh, to them, they'd say, oh, you're just saying L three times, I can't hear any difference between them. Providing they were in uh, context of uh, words. Um, and uh, you can uh, see this uh, for yourselves quite easily if you take uh, something like uh, the on the handout. I think we put it on here as well. Uh, Leslie told Paul to clean the children's playroom. Leslie told Paul to clean the children's playroom. Then you'll be able to hear there that these L's are all there, but they, uh, they don't sound at all odd as I produce them. If, however, I turned them round and I said instead of uh, Paul or told, I said Paul, Paul, then I'd be putting clear L where dark L normally uh, is. There are some accents in English that uh, do this. Welsh English, uh, for instance, often has uh, clear Ls uh, everywhere. On the other hand, I could also uh, have uh, something like a, a, a dark L where I'd expect a clear L to be. So I could also have a little there. Once again, you'll find some varieties of English that do this. Many American varieties of English uh, do, do uh, this, for instance. When Americans talk about uh, uh, a wife, I often, uh, uh, and a life, they often sound to me very much the same because the American dark L can be very dark in initial uh, position. Uh, the uh, voice of cell you can hear in clean and play. Uh, and this there doesn't sound unusual uh, at all. Um, we can provide fairly uh, good rules for the distribution uh, of these, uh, of these uh, different uh, allophones, as they're called. And we can say that voiceless L follows word initial P or K. Dark L occurs before consonant or pause. And clear L occurs elsewhere. And we call this situation complementary distribution. That is to say, every, every allophone is the complement of the other. Where one is, the others cannot be. Um, as I say, native speakers often don't realize that different allophones uh, sound uh, different from each other. Notice, by the way, that phonemes are abstractions. They exist only in our minds. Uh, you can't really talk about pronouncing uh, a phoneme uh, if, you're in, um, if you're being strict uh, about it. On the other hand, allophones are reality. Allophones are the sounds uh, which are the reality uh, of speech. Uh, you can measure them, you can analyze them, etc., etc. When we refer to a phoneme uh, being produced as an allophone, we often say it's being realized. So the abstraction is being made real. And therefore, uh, we term it a realization of a phoneme. So if somebody here, one of your tutors, talk about this being realized, it means that the particular phoneme is in inverted commas, being pronounced, turned into uh, an alpha. We move on to something which is going to affect us all on this course. Uh, if you're either a non-native learning English, or alternatively, uh, even if you're a native speaker and you're 
concerned with teaching people English, and that is uh, what we can term contrastive uh, analysis. One of the useful things about phonetics is that it enables us to contrast the sound systems of uh, two languages. And so if you're somebody who's uh, learning uh, a language, then this is, can be a very useful thing to do. Why? Because the sound systems of different languages are different, sometimes strikingly so. To give you one very often quoted example, and often quoted examples are often the best, that's the reason why they're often quoted, uh, we can take the, uh, what we can call the close front vowels of English, where you have two vowels, I and E. And the many words can be found which will, so we get many minimal pairs. So we can have sin versus seen, for example. And in Spanish, on the other hand, you only have one vowel in that area. You only have an E-type vowel. Same goes for Japanese, same goes for Italian, the same goes for many other languages. Well, what happens when a Spaniard comes to deal with the English vowel system? He's faced, he or she is faced with uh, sin and seen, and they don't make any contrast uh, between them. Not so bad with uh, sin and seen. Uh, because it can't cause any complications in your life. On the other hand, I hope you'll excuse me for telling this story, because it's a true story. At one time, when I was totally poverty-stricken, I had to let a room in my house uh, in order to uh, pay the rent at the end of the uh, month. And so I had a Spanish gentleman who came to uh, stay with us, and we uh, provided people with bed linen. But, so with uh, sheets. And so anyway, this man was given, some people are anticipating it already, this man was given his uh, bed linen, we had supposed, we'd put it in the room. But he then came down and addressed a sort of august selection of people who I, I had in the room, I can't remember who they were now, university students or something as well. He came down and said, I haven't got the shits. Can you give me the shits? <laughs> And uh, somebody certainly should have told him about contrast, how contrastive analysis would, analysis would, would, would have helped his uh, pronunciation. Um, the next thing which I want to uh, talk about are different types of uh, transcription. Uh, we can have, of course, conventional orthography, ordinary spelling. We can put that between these angled brackets, if we want to indicate that this is definitely uh, ordinary spelling we're dealing with. Phonemic transcription just shows phonemes. It also normally uh, has stress marked, as here, so rock climbers will show in that way. We can also add to our phonemic transcription and put in a few phonetic symbols, like the upside down R to indicate the English R sound. Uh, this is a glottal stop. This is uh, uh, the uh, uh, uh sound uh, in uh, English. So this gives us rock climbers. And to show that I've got this little catch in my throat there, rock climbers, I have the uh, symbol for glottal stop there. On the other hand, I could also write narrow phonetic transcription, that's the term for it, narrow detailed phonetic transcription, and this gives us all these uh, extra uh, diacritics, as there says there now, and sudden and strange, uh, these diacritics are the little marks, not here, and also uh, a number of uh, symbols of that type, uh, and that uh, we can then call narrow transcription, to represent the same one times. Reminder of the bracketing, slant brackets, phonemic, square brackets, phonetics, and angle brackets for ordinary uh, spelling. If you're just dealing with phonemes and nothing else, you don't need to put 
in the slant brackets all the time. Some people, by the way, call slant brackets slashes. So uh, slashes and slant brackets uh, are the same thing. There are two main varieties in, uh, of English. And the models I referred to at the beginning are good examples of this. British accents, for the most part, including RP, are what we call non-rhotic. Non-rhotic means that R is only pronounced, R is only pronounced if it's before a vowel. General American, like most American accents, not all, but like most American accents, also like Canadian English, is rhotic. In a rhotic accent, R is pronounced wherever it occurs. So this gives us two examples here. So the rhotic accent, uh, as I would imitate it, would be the farmer's carts are in the yard. Compare that with RP, non-rhotic, R pronounced only before the vowel, and that gives us the farmer's carts are in the yard. Some people have the mistaken idea that it's only uh, RP, only we see pronunciation that produces this non-rhotic form. It's just not true. Uh, virtually, well, the vast majority of accents spoken in England and Wales are non-rhotic. Uh, in Scotland, I'm married to uh, a Scot, so I'm surrounded by uh, rhotic pronunciation much of the, uh, much of the time. Uh, Scottish English is uh, exclusively uh, rhotic, and uh, Irish English is also rhotic. Um, but uh, in uh, England and Wales, as I say, overwhelmingly, one has uh, non-rhotic uh, uh, accents, including uh, RP. So there we are. I've now come to the end of uh, my uh, lecture. I just want to say a couple of concluding uh, things. We've dealt here with pronunciation models, British and American. Uh, we also talked about the phoning and the uses and the usefulness of transcription. Of those, I want to underline the last. Uh, Henry Sweet, the great 19th century phonetician, referred to phonetics as the indispensable foundation of language. I would refer to transcription as the indispensable foundation of phonetics. If you can manage over the course of the next uh, couple of weeks to learn to uh, read transcription and learn to make transcriptions, then you will have done something which will help you throughout the rest of your phonetic lives. Uh, so I wish you well with it. <laughs>